Good morning, church. If you can all get on your feet and let us come and adore our Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus for his faithfulness.
God from age to age. God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. History can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to Uh, remain standing. We're going to watch a quick video together. Morning. My name is John. I'm Melinda. And we're the Lears. And we were born in, or grew up in Livermore in the East Bay. Um, for the last 25 years, we've lived in various locations in the Bay Area for school and work. And we moved to San Jose five years ago, pretty much to the month. 
And four and a half years ago, we came to church on the hill. Our first Sunday here, we actually sat in Ron and Verna's row. And after, after service, Verna came up and introduced herself to us. And she said she thought it would be a good idea if we came back next Sunday. So we did, and we have been. All right. So we're thankful to be able to celebrate this season with you. The candle we lit represents love. And we want to read this verse about love for you. First John 4, 9 and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins.
Jesus, we thank you so much for being here in this place. Uh, I can feel the spirit move right now, Jesus, and we're so grateful that you're with us at all times. Um, we want to give you all the glory, Jesus. You're so faithful. Uh, you keep your promises, and you're always there for us. Thank you for the compassion that you've shown us, Jesus. Um, throughout everything that we've done, we absolutely do not deserve forgiveness, and yet you still gave it to us. Um, you died for our sins, and we are so, so thankful for that. Um, I pray that as we are listening to Scott speak today, that uh, you'll really pull on our heartstrings and just really tell us something that we need to hear today. Uh, we thank you so much, Jesus, in your wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Would you please be seated? Good morning, everyone. My name is David. Welcome to Church on the Hill. Are you guys getting excited for Christmas, starting to make some preparations? My family is. Yeah, I mean, Christmas cards, that can be a center of some decision, right? We're trying to decide whether to use, like, the regular alphabet with all 26 letters or the Christmas alphabet. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the Christmas alphabet, of course, has no L. So... Yeah, so it's a big debate in our house, um, and of course it's called an alphabet, but whatever. Uh, all right, well, I want to welcome you all here today. I've got three announcements with three components in under three minutes. Here we go. First of all, if you are new to this church, or maybe a second time attender, or you haven't connected with us yet, we want to do that. There are three ways you can connect. First of all, you can shake hands with somebody and meet us out at the, uh, in the lobby at the, at the greeting booth. We would love to meet you face to face. You can connect by filling out a connect card in the seat back in front of you, or you can text Koth Connect to 94000 on your phone. You'll get a brief survey with similar information to what's on the connect card, and you can connect that way. We'll just reach out. We, wanna, we want to connect with you, and we'll take it from there. Second announcement. We have three Christmas services. First is Christmas Eve service, 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve, yeah, okay, okay, just testing, just making sure you're listening. Okay, and that'll be at 5 p.m. That is the best service to invite friends and family to. We've made it at 5 p.m. Those of you who heard Scott's Friday announcements, you, you know this already. We want you to bring your family and friends, and then that gives you freedom to go have your Christmas Eve celebration afterwards, but we can connect uh, with the real meaning of Christmas uh, at that time. Additionally, there is an online service that will release at midnight um, if you're like me, I sometimes stay up and watch the Vatican service. I do that. I don't know why I do that. I can't understand half of it. It's in Latin, but it's just a tradition. So now <laughs> you can actually watch our service at midnight if you choose to do that, or any time during the next day. It'll be online for you. And then finally, for those who want to meet in person on Christmas Day, we will have a smaller service in the chapel at 10 a.m. Third announcement, three components. Let's pause. Let's pause for our giving back and returning to God what is already his that he blessed us with. If you have it already set up automatically, fantastic. But if you need to give today, and you are a regular attender or member of this church, we invite you to do that in three ways. You see them on the uh, projector behind me. And uh, just take a minute to do that. All right. So now I'll turn it over to Pastor Scott. All right. Thanks, Dave. Dave, I feel like whenever you do announcements, I not only get to know a little bit more about the church, but I get to know a little bit more about random stuff in your life. <laughs> what a blessing. <clears throat> All right. Uh, it, it is the Christmas season, which mean, means this. This last Tuesday was anyone? Giving Tuesday. Yes, of course. Giving Tuesday is when you have all those random emails in your email box, right? Right? What are, what's Giving Tuesday? It's when all these uh, charitable organizations, they ask for your end of the year donations, right? I don't know what your favorite one was, but let me just give you um, four of the lesser known charitable organizations. Here's one, the Critter Connection. It was started in 2004 to make sure that no guinea pig gets left behind. They rescue and rehabil the Rescue and Rehabilitation Center takes on neglected or abandoned guinea pigs when necessary. They help nurse them back to health and then find them loving homes. To this day, they've helped save over 1,500 guinea pigs. So just in case you miss Giving Tuesday and want to give to that, it's there. Uh, helping Hands Monkey Helpers. This is real. I found it on the internet. Similar to dogs, monkeys are known to make great service animals. They've been training monkeys to help adults with spinal cord injuries and other mobility impairments since 1979. 
This has been going on for a long time. I've never heard of this. Uh, the third one, I guarantee you've never heard of, the Zombie Squad. This organization is in the zombie removal business. But when business is slow, they spend their efforts on charitable undertakings. They host disaster relief fundraisers, disaster preparation seminars, and they volunteer their time at emergency response agencies. Uh, the fourth and final one, I didn't know this existed either, Tall Clubs International Foundation. This organization focuses on promoting causes that benefit the special needs of exceptionally tall people. They aim to help take kids to greater heights <laughs> by providing scholarships for young men and women of a certain tall stature. And I was super curious. I was like, well, how tall? And so I went and looked it up online. Uh, apparently, women, if you are taller than 5'10", you apply. Guys taller than 6'2", this is for you. There are scholarships available. You know, there, as funny as that might be, every single one of these charitable organizations, in fact, every charitable or organization in the world has the same thing in common. They're all about this one word. They're all about the word compassion. Because a charitable organization is there to help someone else with a need that they might have. Now, you might not know this, but all the organizations in the world who stress any kind of compassion actually have their roots in, in the Christian faith. You might think I'm exaggerating, but here's what I mean. The world that Jesus was born into was not a world of compassion. Compassion was actually a sign of weakness and waste. If you found someone who was weak or struggling, for you to devote resources towards them was a sign of irresponsibility. The world was based off of logic and reason. And compassion is illogical because you're helping the weak instead of becoming the strong. The sign of strength of their day 2,000 years ago was this, domination, not compassion. So I, I do want to show you where this comes in the Bible. Open up to Colossians chapter 3. Um, I'm going to compare Colossians 3 to a lot of other writings in the Roman and the Greek world at the time. We've been in this series called Core Sample, right? It's about the core sample is how fit is the foundation underneath what you're building. And so we're talking about building our lives on the foundation of Christ. So today I'm going to talk about building compassion, and you're going to get something that you've probably never heard of before. Because there's an opposite side to compassion. It's the challenge of compassion. We'll get there in just a minute. The world that Jesus was born into, the world that he lived in, and the world of the early church in the first century, their idea of compassion was countercultural. Now, to begin with, here's how Paul describes compassion. But he doesn't start with the character quality. Here's what he starts with. Our identity. It's about who we are. Here's what he says. Colossians chapter 3 Verse 12, by the way, have your, your notes open, have your Bibles open so you can follow along. Super easy to follow along today. He writes this, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Before he tells us to be compassionate, he says this, I want you to know who you are. You're God's chosen people, you are holy, and you're dearly loved by God. Here's your identity. You're a loved son of God. You're a loved daughter of God. That's actually who you are. And Christians, Christians are simply people who have said yes to being adopted by God because of his love for us. Now, the Old Testament, there's an interesting verse in Deuteronomy 7, chapter 7, verse 7. It's when God rescues his people from Egypt, and then he describes why he chose them, and it reads this way. The Lord did not set his affection on you, his love for, for you. And he did not choose you because you were numerous, more numerous than other peoples. For you were the fewest of all people. But it was because the Lord loved you. Why did God choose the Hebrew people? Why did he rescue them from Egypt? Simply because he loved them. And honestly, that's true for you and me too. It's true for every Christian. We didn't become Christians because we were super smart and figured it out. You didn't become a Christian because, um, you know, you got lucky. You became a Christian because God chose to open your mind and your heart 
And you had to respond by saying yes to that. So before he calls us to a life of compassion, you have to know your identity and who he is. Now, this is not how the Romans or the Greeks were taught. When they practiced religion, one historian writes it this way. He writes, any favorable or unfavorable circumstances in Roman life could be attributed to the mood of certain gods. So people would likewise, they'd make their offerings to the god in thanks or in an attempt to appease the god's tempers. Unlike many monotheistic religions or spiritual traditions, the Roman gods were seen as caring little about the morality of the Roman people. They would never call them to a, a life of compassion. Rather, their chief concern was being paid tribute through very specific rituals. The Christian faith actually trusts in a God's goodness and his love. The, the Roman gods and the Greek gods were all in competition with one another for the power and control of, of people's lives and the world. They definitely were not about loving people. So question, why is our identity so important before we get into how we behave? It's because of this. Out of our identity, we have responsibility. If someone is told all their life, you're a loser, you'll never amount to anything, you will behave a certain way. You'll take on responsibility in your life based off of what you believe about your identity. So the identity that we have as a loved son, a loved daughter of the king, you're going to take on this responsibility. Number two, it's the responsibility of compassion. But look at where he goes next. Remember, he, he just said this. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, now here's his action, the responsibility. He says, clothe yourselves, put it on. Go grab this item and clothe yourself with it. Clothe yourselves with, with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So if none of these qualities were characteristics of the Greek and, Greek and the Roman gods, if all of these features are actually unique to the Christian faith, every single charitable organization in the world, they will find their roots right here in the person of Jesus. Because in the first century, what everybody valued was power and control and domination. Um, let me explain some of this. Um, Aristotle, fourth century Greek philosopher, fourth century BC, um, he writes this about owning slaves. He says, quote, there's no different, there is no difference from a living tool. The slave is no different from a living tool. I'll get this right sooner or later. The slave is no different from a living tool. And what consideration can a tool receive? And he goes on to say this. When the tool isn't useful anymore, when the tool breaks, what do you do? You discard it. The same way with a slave. That person that you own when they're no longer useful, discard them. And it doesn't matter if you're discarding them by killing them. There was no penalty for that. This is the value, or I'll say lack of value, of human life. There's a man, he was writing a letter to his wife, and it was, there was some of it was kind of a love letter, and he's just writing kind of words of affection to his wife. The guy's name is Hilarion, and it's, it's written in the year 1 B.C., let me read this to you. I think it's in your notes there too. Uh, he, he says to, he writes to his wife, Elise, he says, warmest greetings. It's a good way to start. He says, I want you to know that we are still in Alexandria. Don't worry if when they all go home, I stay in Alexandria. I beg and entreat you, take care of the little child. And as soon as we get our pay, I will send it to you. Now, up until this point, it sounds like a, a nice letter, but we Come to find out, she's pregnant, and so he continues to write. He says, if, good luck to you, you bear a child. If it is a boy, let it live. If it's a girl, throw it out. You told Epaphroditus to tell me, don't forget me. How could I possibly forget you? Don't worry. In the middle of this affectionate kind of love letter to his wife, he's like, oh, how could I forget you? By the way, I know you're going to deliver soon if the baby, you know, if it lives and you have a boy, fantastic. If it's a girl, just dump it. 
Now, you might not know this, but there was the regular practice in the Roman, um, in the Roman Empire known as exposure. It's infanticide. If you didn't want your child for any reason, you would take it to an area, a dump in, in or outside the city, and you would just leave it there. And that child would die of exposure to the elements. And it became the practice of the first century church to every day walk through that dump. Why? To look for babies. To look for these little girls or kids who didn't look like they should or kids that you could tell had disabilities. They were discarded. And the church would come by and they would pick them up and care for them as if they were their own. This was the normal practice for the church because that was the normal practice for the Roman Empire. Compassion wasn't even on the radar of the Romans. That practice of exposure, it didn't actually become illegal to 372 AD after Constantine had become a Christian and and the Roman emperor and even took time after that. Here's my point. Because of the character of God, his love and his compassion, we've been invited to be like him, to show the world who God is by being people of compassion. When we've recognized this, when you, when you adopt the identity of a loved child of God, it's been because your heart's been grabbed by it, that he loves you, that you realize he chose you because he had compassion on you, and it affects you somehow. It affects you to become people who are more like him so that we show compassion on people, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Um, the last pagan emperor of Rome, Julian, he was known as Julian the Apostate. I'm assuming that's not positive. One historian writes this about Julian. He says this, Julian recognized that the Christian act of compassion was, was one, be- the, let me try that again. Julian recognized that the Christian practice of compassion was one cause behind the transformation of the faith, the Christian faith, from a small movement on the edge of the empire to cultural ascendancy. He's saying this, the the main feature of why Christianity grew is because of compassion. So Julian wrote a letter to the pagan priests around Rome, and he wrote this, when it came about that the poor were neglected and overlooked by the pagan priest, then I think the the impious Galileans, the Christians, observed this fact, and they devoted themselves to philanthropy, taking care of them. He says the Christians support not only their poor, but our poor as well. And all men see that our people lack aid from us. Julian goes on to say this. He tried to convince the pagan priests, you know what we need to do to increase paganism? We need to start showing compassion on people because because it's working for the Christians. And now there's, they're slowly gaining popularity and momentum. And the Christian church is growing and paganism is shrinking. Isn't that funny? You know what's hilarious about it? It was unsustainable for the pagan priests to teach people how to be compassionate. Why? The gods that they worship weren't compassionate. You're going to become like the one that you worship. And if you worship a fickle God who is angry with you and you're always trying to appease him, you're not going to be a person of compassion. See, here's the worst thing I could think that could happen today. You walk out of here thinking that I'm trying to motivate you, guilt you to showing compassion for people, and I'm not. Here's, I think, what Paul is stating, is that Jesus, God's son, is absolutely irresistible because of his compassion. And we will become like the God who we find our identity in. So, Here's the challenge to this, though. I mean, it sounds great right now, right? My identity is I'm loved by God. woo Who doesn't like that? And so you get to, to have this responsibility of showing compassion. And you're like, wow, I'm like, I'm like the charitable organization every day. It feels like I'm going to be Santa Claus for the rest of my life. And then you realize what compassion costs us. And here's the challenge. The challenge is Entitlement. Don't you hate that word? Because if someone called you entitled, you would be absolutely 
offended. Now, it's typically the older generation that looks at the younger generation and says, they're so entitled. Don't they? You're kind of giggling at that, right? Well, you know why? If, if they were entitled, I'm not saying they are, but if they act entitled, do you know why they act entitled? Because parents, you raised them like that. They turn out how we raise them. You gave them everything. They didn't have to work for much, and yeah, they feel entitled. I realize I may have just made some enemies. I just blame parents for how their kids turned out. Not always, 99% of the time, I'm sure it's not you. What it means to be entitled. Here's just a couple definitions. To act like you deserve something good. To have an air about you that people should treat you right. To feel like you deserve respect, praise, and acknowledgement. To be, believe you have a right to privilege or special treatment. Well, that doesn't sound as bad as how I was like feeling about it. Like those people, that kind of sounds more like, like me. I, I think I deserve respect. Okay, maybe not praise, right? We don't want to take it too far. But I want to get credit for what I do well. Here's what entitlement might sound like. I am such a hard worker. I don't understand why I still can't manage to find this high-paying job. I'm tired of being single. I've remained pure and sought Christ, so why hasn't he brought a spouse into my life? I deserve to have children, so why am I struggling with infertility? After all, aren't children a blessing from God? Look at me. I'm not saying that feeling is wrong. There's pain in that for a lot of men and women. But at the root of that, it's a part of feeling like we're entitled to good things in life. I'm a good homemaker and work hard to keep the house clean and tidy. I deserve to have a nicer, bigger home. I've worked hard to provide for my family. I deserve to watch TV when I come home. By the way, don't say amen right now. It's just bad timing. I've been good with my finances. I deserve to buy whatever I want for a change. I worked hard at work. I deserve to be acknowledged for my contributions. Maybe those words sound like something that's rolled off your mouth before. My hope is, is instead of looking down at people like, oh, they're so entitled, that maybe we might recognize that we sometimes feel entitled. And we will really struggle with the responsibility of compassion if we don't face the challenge of how we feel entitled. So this is where I get this from in the scriptures. Look at the very next verse. He says, therefore, God's as God's chosen people, holy, dearly love, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then he says this, bear with each other. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. You might be wondering, like, the word entitlement is not used there. You're right, it's not. But he says this, I want you to bear with each other. But if I bear with someone who offends me or treats me wrong or isn't pleasant to be around, listen, I deserve better treatment than that. I shouldn't have to put up with that. Or maybe you have said, I just, I don't need friends like that. And you write somebody off for how they've treated you instead of bearing with each other. Paul writes, forgive one another. And if any of you have a grievance against someone, against someone, you know what? Listen, it's justified. I'm unfriending them because... You're never going to believe what so-and-so did to me. Now, listen, listen. I'm not gossiping. I'm just sharing so you and I can pray for them. I forgive them, but they're dead to me now. Why? Because I deserve better. Here's the truth. We can often feel entitled when we get offended by people. Right? 
I'm entitled to an apology. I'm entitled to better treatment. I'm entitled to reparations. I'm entitled to compensation. I'm entitled to better friendships. I'm entitled to a better marriage. I'm entitled to more respect. I mean, fill in whatever words you want, but I'm entitled to that because it's fair, right? See, you never use the word entitled to describe yourself, but you would say, hey, listen, that's not fair. Big picture here. Our identity as as sons and daughters to a compassionate God means that we embrace our responsibility to be compassionate towards others, which means we have to release our entitlement. It's interesting when Paul wrote this because you're not sure who's in the room when this is read. What I mean by that is Paul would write this and he would send this with someone to be read at the church at Colossae. But it's interesting because later on in the book, he tells the story of this guy by the name of Onesimus. Flip over to chapter four real quick. I want to tell you Onesimus' story. His name actually means helper. He was a slave in the city of Colossae. And he ran away from his master. Now, somewhere along the way, he became a follower of Jesus. We're not sure if it's when he was in Colossae or when he left. But somehow, he becomes this follower of Jesus. He becomes adopted into God's family, embraced by the church. He's a valuable and respected member of the church. Paul knows him personally, and he becomes an assistant to Paul. Now, the owner he ran away from, He's in this church at Colossae, and his name is Philemon. You recognize that name? Because it's a letter in the New Testament where Paul writes Philemon a letter. Now, first of all, Colossians chapter 4, verse 7, we get introduced to Onesimus. It says this, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a fellow minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances, that he may encourage your hearts. And then he writes this, He's coming with Onesimus. Bum, 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 bum. I mean, don't think about Paul writing this. I want you to think about Tychicus reading this at the church at Coloss, just like this. And Tychicus starts reading this. I'm sending my dear and faithful brother Tychicus, and he will read to you all of this, and he's bringing with you Onesimus. And Onesimus is standing back here. He's the slave that used to live in that town. And in the audience out here is sitting Philemon. He's in the back row and he ain't happy. Are you getting the scene right now? But this is what he writes. He's coming with Onesimus. And this is how he describes him. Our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. And he just kind of stops and cuts it off. So here's what you have to do. You actually have to flip over to the letter of Philemon. I put it in your notes there on the right-hand side uh, as you open it up. Let let me just read this in verse 8. It's such a short book that there's no chapters. It's just one chapter. So it's chapter 1, I guess, verse 8. He writes, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than it is as none other than Paul, an old man, now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. He calls him his son, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you. Why? Well, he was a runaway slave. But now he's become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. I love this guy. He's my son in the faith. I'm sending him back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. He's realizing that there's something in this guy's life. I'm going to send him back to you because there's some unfinished business. Perhaps the reason, verse 15, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, 
but better than a slave, a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man, as a brother in the Lord. Do you realize what he's asking of Philemon? All the wrongs done to you by Onesimus, don't take him back as your slave. I want you to embrace him as your brother in Christ. He goes on, he says, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. And if he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I love this. Paul's like, Philemon, your faith, who you are, you owe me everything. But by the way, if Onesimus owes you anything, you put it on my tab. The tab that you still owe me. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit for you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident in your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. You get it now? So when he says this, listen, you're a loved son and a loved daughter of the king. That's your identity. And then your responsibility is this. I want you to start putting on compassion. He writes that with Philemon in the audience. And Philemon's probably sitting back there like, oh, we should show compassion. Okay, that sounds really good. It's feel, it feels good. Like you should, it's almost like a Santa Claus elf, right? Like I, I should just be compassionate to everybody. Just love. Like I'm, I'm the good fairy of compassion. And then Onesimus shows up. You're like, compassion? You know what that guy stole from me? You know what that guy owes me? And Onesimus, excuse me, and, and Philemon cannot show compassion unless he gives up what he's entitled to or what he feels entitled to. John Piper states it this way, a sense of deservedness or entitlement will keep us from truly knowing Christ. When we understand the Christian faith, we recognize that Jesus came to us out of his own compassion for us. Let me read this to you. It's from Philippians chapter 2, and it describes when Christ came to earth. I'm going to read it from the message. It reads this way. Think of yourselves. So how you see yourself when you look in the mirror, here's how I want you to think of yourself the way that Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death, the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. See, compassion sounds noble, almost fun, until we realize that compassion costs us giving up and releasing our entitlement. And it's weird because it shows up in weird ways. During the pandemic, um, I remember getting on a flight with Southwest and, uh, you know, the, the pilot, the co-pilot, and all the, um, the servers, sorry, what's the word for it? Flight attendants, thank you. Flight attendants, they all get on. And they have these cool masks, and I recognize their masks. This is back when you had to wear a mask, right? And Because uh, they had the same cool one that I did. There, there's this guy who was a trainer at, I think it was the University of Kansas, and he developed this mask, and it was kind of meshy looking, but supposedly it like caught the virus, whatever. And I was like, oh, it's cool. You know why it's cool? Because you can breathe with it on. And it's not all like, you know, you, you're on a, I was on a five-hour flight going to Florida, and like, man, I, I, I kind of like to breathe on the way there. So I, I put this on, and I just watched all of them go by, and I go to get on, and the guy stops me, and he goes, oh, you can't fly with that mask. And I wanted to go, did you see the five people who work for this airline that are just got on with the same mask? And I was like, uh, uh, okay. Took it off, grabbed another one, put it on. He goes, oh, actually, that one won't work either. I pulled another one out of my bag because everyone flies with three masks, right? Will this one work? Do you hear the entitlement in me? I was just a little irritated. 
just a little bugged, instead of going, wow, this guy's job? I wouldn't want it for anything. I mean, talk about a hard thing, trying to work for an airline during a pandemic. He probably doesn't want to be there either. Do you see how entitlement can slowly just creep into us? I deserve what? Now listen, I deserve what from whom? Is there anybody in your life that maybe has offended you? Not treated you right? Didn't give you the respect you thought you deserved? And maybe you truly did deserve more respect than that. But if our identity is a son or a daughter of the God who showed compassion on us, then our responsibility is this. Every day, I put on the garment of compassion. Why? Because it changed the first century world from a place dominated by, by power and control that didn't understand what compassion was like at all. And it became the adopted religion of Rome. They used to, for sport, put Christians in an arena and kill them just for fun. And the place where they used to do that now has crosses. Because compassion won the day. And we live in a valley where people don't understand who Christ is, and can we be honest, does does the church, I don't mean our church, but does the church in general, the Christian church, face challenges in their reputation all the time? High profile Christian people, you only hear about them in the news when something goes wrong and they make bad choices. And the reputation of the Christian church has to be recaptured in this valley by compassion. But here's the outcome. It changes your community. And this is point number four. We'll wrap up with this. Our community then becomes about love, unity, and peace. This is how Paul finishes. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Wouldn't it be awesome to belong to a church where people loved each other and there was unity? And then he says this, let the peace of Christ Rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. I'm going to state it this way. I don't want to be entitled to what is owed me. Hear this. I don't want to be entitled to what is owed me. Here's why. Because I don't want to be entitled for what I owe. What do I owe Jesus? Well, the penalty for my sin is death. Separation from God, now and for eternity. That's what I owe. But Christ stepped in, died on the cross in my place, paid my debt. I don't want what I owe. Therefore, I'm not going to be entitled for what I think other people owe me. Because that's who Christ was for me. And I'm hoping it actually changes me. I want us to have a, just a moment of prayer, um, but I'm just going to do this. I'm going to read the scriptures that we've been looking at this morning, and as I read, you'll hear my voice, but here's what I'd like for you to do. I want you to listen to the voice of God, because he might bring a person or a situation or maybe one of your own feelings or attitudes to mind where you're feeling entitled, so I'm going to have our band come out here. And they're going to lead us in worship for just a moment. But let me invite you to do this. I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. Not distracted by anything around you. And I just want to know if maybe God is going to speak and invite you to respond. Here's the word of God. Therefore, as God's chosen people, Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave 
you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And everybody said, amen. Stand with us. Let's sing. See on the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me, my Jesus set me free. Look at the wounds that give me life, grace flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice. What he's done. What he said, all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven, my future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. Thank you guys so much for singing with us today. Uh, let's be compassionate in the Bay. Have a great Sunday, and we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>